The number of people that have a food allergy or a food intolerance is probably staggering. We don't really have statistics on this, but in my estimation, it's probably half the population. I know that uh, gluten sensitivity can, and intolerance can be a really big matter. I don't know what are the most common food allergies that I don't know about. I do have reactions mainly to wheat and dairy and my children as well. I am gluten intolerant and I also react to dairy, which for some reason we call an allergy, but they're the same kind of thing. They're both immune reactions to the food. You don't know how crappy you're feeling <laughs> until you take gluten out of your diet. <laughs> I am gluten free. I was diagnosed in 2003 with celiac disease. I was diagnosed with celiac disease. I'm celiac. not celiac, but I avoid gluten. I have a dairy intolerance in my family. My mother and my brother are both dairy intolerant. I'm allergic to sulfates, like in the wines. I can't drink wines because I get real allergic. I'm allergic to dairy products, cheeses, any, any kind of meat. As I get older, I'm developing more food allergies, which is really a bummer, because the list of things that I can eat is getting shorter and shorter. I am allergic or intolerant to chocolate, beef, eggs, dairy, wheat, corn. I can't have bananas. I can't have uh, raw vegetables. I can't have high mercury fish. I can't have certain nuts. There are a lot of things that I just can't eat. If I have too much dairy, yeah, you know, but I think it's like that with everyone. We're not supposed to have cow's milk. It's for baby cows. Probably one of my best friends has the most food allergies I ever known. They are allergic to like soy, shellfish, barley, paprika, eggplant, lactose intolerance, dairy, gluten, and okra. Duck eggs. I know a few people are gluten free, gluten intolerance. My dog has a wheat allergy. Yeah, lately I've been developing um, nut allergies. So I lost peanuts about a year and a half ago. I lost almonds about a year ago. I lost coconut about six months ago. So I'm guessing that probably in another year or two, I won't be able to eat any nuts. One of my best friends is, is very allergic to peanuts and anything, touching anything with peanut oil or anything, it's really bad. Peanut allergies, uh, allergic to pineapple, um, a couple of different fruits. A few of my friends have like peanut allergies. Yeah, I have friends who have uh, peanut allergies. Deathly allergic to peanut butter. I have a cousin who's like intensely gluten intolerant and she actually only figured that out a couple of years ago after like a period of 10 years of pretty crazy health effects and depression. Um, so it was a real relief for her to find out. We got him tested and it turned out that he had celiac disease and that was the cause for his sudden plateauing on growth. And so, of course, you go, well, if he has celiac disease, I know it's genetic. So he got it from somewhere. So we all got tested. People don't understand the difference between a symptom and a cause. And you end up getting treated for symptoms and rather than somebody getting to the bottom of the problem and treating the cause. Now, let me give you an example. If you break your arm, you know what the cause was. If you go in, though, with any of the hundreds of chronic problems, IBS being one of them, there's all kinds of other problems, what will they do? They won't even generally try to dig for the cause. They'll treat the symptom. You'll get a drug. You'll get something to patch it. And the doctor will just cross their fingers and hope it goes away, and that you go away. And one area that's really mystified us is food allergy. Now, when you know, I said that you recognize any compound that's not you. Well, what happens when you eat all these things that you're eating? You eat every kind of food, it's got every kind of chemical. Why don't you make antibodies to everything? And the answer is because you're made to recognize things that are harmful, but not necessarily a good thing. So, if you say you have an allergy to milk, the truth is you don't have an allergy to milk. Milk is one of the things you have an intolerance because you don't have enough lactic enzyme that digests lactic acid. So that is not an allergy, that's a food intolerance for, for a different reason. But for years it was called food allergy, 
And a lot of things are called food allergy that may not be food allergy. They may be what we call intolerance. Now, how do you know what's tolerated or not? Unfortunately, it's the most complicated area yet. The area that, des that decides what you can eat and what you can't is laid down in the first few months of your life. But it's the most complicated part of immunology to learn how we can be tolerant to most foods and react to other foods. The gut contains up to 80% of our total body's immune system. So that's a pretty big deal. And in that gut, we have these normal and abnormal bacteria, and they have to live harmoniously together to process food and to recognize the difference between what we would consider me and not me. Right? So the body likes me inside of it. It doesn't like not me inside of it. And when we eat food that is either not processed well because it's poorly digested or contains chemicals or genetically modified or has toxins or infections or that type of a thing, or we just lack digestive enzymes and don't process it well, or our body looks at that as not me and makes antibodies against what it looks like as a foreign antigen. Food allergies and sensitivities and intolerances really are all related to food, but they're very different things. So allergies are a type of hypersensitivity reaction that's mediated by a certain part of the immune system called IgE, immune globulin E. And you have an immediate, within 20 minute, allergic reaction where your body produces certain chemicals, you know, the typical, your throat closes, your um, lips blow up, etc. food allergy. Food sensitivity is also an immune issue but it's not a hypersensitivity issue and it's mediated by something called IgG or immune globulin G, different part of the immune system. And it's a delayed reaction, could be up to four days. And it creates symptoms that are not always gastrointestinal. Those symptoms can be joint pain or gas or headache or many other types of things like that. And intolerance is not an immune-mediated thing. For instance, lactose intolerance, or you eat beans and it causes gas, or you um, eat this kind of food and it makes your tongue tingle, or those are reactions that you have to something where you're intolerant to it, but it's not a disease. Celiac disease is different. It's an autoimmune response. So again, it's, it's that reaction to the protein in particular, but it's a different antibody pathway. It's an IgA-mediated pathway. And what's important there is that it's not just a reaction to the food, but it causes this cascade of autoimmune responses that actually does cause damage long term. So while the symptoms may not happen as rapidly, the long term effect is, is, can be devastating. What's important to realize in each of these different um, pathways, whether it's an allergy, an intolerance, or celiac disease, which is autoimmune, is that having one does not exclude you from having any of the others. So you can, just because you have celiac disease, doesn't mean that you don't have or couldn't have a food allergy or a food intolerance. And potentially, as you said, it could be to the same ingredient too, where you could be not only allergic to wheat, but gluten sensitive too. Most common is what we find is when the gut's affected in celiac disease, that intestine is so damaged that it can cause um, reactions or inability to digest multiple other foods. And that's important that, you know, one doesn't exclude the other at all. Celiac disease is a symptom of gluten sensitivity. And you won't hear a lot of people say that. You won't hear them come out with that. Gluten sensitivity is something a lot of people have. Celiac disease is a particular kind of damage, a particular symptom that some people have. From my standpoint, I don't use uh, food sensitivity more because, again, it's uh, it's not the exact you know term which I like. There's a, an acute response, which is allergy. There's a delayed response, which is uh, intolerance. And sensitivity is something in between. They've asked that we stop using the term gluten intolerance because it's very confusing to people. Because people have heard of lactose intolerance. And they know if you have lactose intolerance, that if you take lactase enzymes, you then can eat lactose without getting the bloating and the gas. 
So the term gluten intolerance suggests that people can take the enzymes that are out on the market today and then go out and eat gluten, and they can't. And they will continue to have the same devastating diseases if they have that approach. The problem uh, with allergy, as a name, is that almost everybody can have an, an antibody to something that uh, makes them allergic to it, which means they get a reaction to it when they eat it, or when they smell it, or when they feel it, touch it. All those things can make you break out in a rash, run a fever, have an upset stomach. So those are reactions that you have that are protecting you against foreign materials. Well, there are some people that make an excess of what we call IgE. That is the antibody that is causing vaccine allergic reactions. It's there to help you, but some people make an excess and they are genetically disposed so that families have a very high incidence of allergy within the family. Twins, about 80% of twins will be allergic to the same thing. There are people, for example, who really are allergic to the protein in peanuts. The protein, not the oil, the protein in the peanut is extremely able to make IgE. And for people who make a lot of IgE, the frequency is very great of having peanut allergy. And that's a real allergy. That could be so acute that smelling a peanut can give you a rash. We know that nuts, seafood, corn, soy, milk, wheat, there are about eight major, major allergens. In the case of food immune reactivities, number one is wheat, number two is milk, and that will follow with corn and rice, whatever we consume more. And if you pay attention to some of these food antigens that the most we react against them are the ones who are the most contaminated with chemicals. For example, corn and aflatoxin. Milk, all depends, you know, what, whatever we feed the cow. And so all the pesticides and chemicals which are in the food get into the milk. And from the milk, uh, obviously the chemicals can bind to the protein of the milk. And now we are react to combination of the pesticides plus the milk proteins such as alpha casein and beta casein. Wheat, the same thing. And, and so I believe uh, one of the studies I did and published in a journal called Nutrients, I measured IgG, IgM, IgA antibody, non-IgE mediated immune reactivities in 1,000 healthy subjects, so-called. 25% of them had very high levels of antibodies against milk and against wheat and its different components. First of all, we don't have a clear statistics. So yes, we do think that they're more prevalent. Uh, and the question is why? The first answer is because people pay more attention to what they eat. So we're a little bit more cautious about what we eat. And we pay more attention between symptoms which we had and the food which we eat, right? It's all the news. And so I think that to some degree, it's a matter of uh, people being a bit more educated, right? So that's number one. Number two, uh, the food which we eat now probably different compared to the food which we ate 20, 30 years ago, and definitely it's different from the food which our parents and grandparents ate. We're dealing with much more food additives right now, so that's number one. We're dealing with uh, genetically modified foods, which is number two. Currently, today, it's four times higher, four times more people have celiac disease than w the numbers that had it back in the 1950s. So it's not the testing. Uh, it's not the testing, it's what's in the blood. Food allergies may seem like they're epidemic right now because a lot of people have intolerances and they confuse those as, as allergies, or maybe the terminologist isn't used as appropriately. Um, I do think, and I speak about intolerances as well, and I think that's your body's way of telling you that this is not kosher in our gut and you should pay attention to that. Food allergies are definitely more prevalent. Uh, the CDC came out in 2013 and said that food allergies have increased 50% between 1997 and 2011. So they are definitely becoming more prevalent today. Our diagnostic testing is definitely getting better. And there are certain labs that are really very good at it, uh, but not yet the national labs, not the routine labs that most physicians use. They are very limited in that. But I think the prevalence also is getting better as our food system changes. 
as, as we genetically change because of these issues, we pass those genes on to our children and, and so on. So it is getting more prevalent. So you're seeing these uh, epidemic rising um, increases in autism, in Asperger's, in asthma, in autoimmune diseases, um, in ADHD. So there's a, a proliferation of uh, these autoimmune kind of other kinds of behavioral disorders. So I, I'm very interested to see how a lot of the studies about gluten and food allergies will be impacting on these other populations as well. I think there's a definite link. If you look at non-celiac gluten sensitivity, if you do the right test, clinically what you find is somewhere between 40 to 60 percent of the people that come into your practice will come back positive on sensitivity to gluten if you do the right test. In the general public, it's somewhere around 20 to 30 percent, but the ones that come to see you are the ones that are sick. So in that population, it's 40 to 60 percent. They're positive. Their immune system is working to protect you. You know, when you have clinical outcomes, there are two possible explanations because the two key players are genes, i.e. your genetic predisposition to react to anything, in this case, food stuff that goes, you know, in the wrong direction, or the environment, something in the environment that is changing the outcome. The epidemics occur in such a short period of time that it's hard to, you know, believe that it's due to genetic modification of the human genome, so whatever we are. Um, th that would take much longer. So it's got to be the environment. So we are changing the environment dramatically and fast enough that we cannot adapt. What in the environment? Well, we can discuss until tomorrow. For sure, the way that we eat. We really need to investigate. We really need to figure out why are we seeing more of them? Why are we seeing allergies in adults, not just children? Why are we seeing new allergies in adults that they didn't have as children? So I think that there's a lot of questions that are being raised that we really need to look at. I think we're more aware of them now. However, they have doubled in the past 10 years, especially in children. You've gone from about 3% of children having food allergies to over 5% of children having food allergies. And the same is with adults. The rate has doubled in the prevalence. The knowledge in the community has increased as well. The increased incidence of allergies, intolerances, and celiac disease, I think is linked to the environment, but not completely. These percentages of allergies will increase from year to year. We cannot say this is due to better detection. If you go back to the history, 1940, 1945, you draw some kind of connection between the number of chemicals introduced into our society plus increasing allergies and autoimmunities, exactly you can find that, you know, that curve. So increase in food allergies and sensitivities and autoimmunities, which 53 million, by the way, of Americans are suffering from autoimmunities, 60 million suffering from classical allergies, and some of them, of course, they have food allergy. When we look at intolerances and allergies, there I think environment plays a role. When we look at what we, we are eating today, it's very different than what we ate 50 years ago. 50 years ago, we ate less processed food, we ate seasonally, and we ate locally. So what happened is that you don't have foods that have as much of these common ingredients as you do now. You also had more variety, and you didn't eat as much of the same food year long. So now our food is almost a monoculture of certain core ingredients, corn, wheat, soy, so that we're exposed to higher amounts of them continually and from one source. So that where the body was not exposed to that high amount and that um, uniformity of ingredients, now we are. And I think that that may be a trigger. Unfortunately, we're pretty short-sighted. You know, we would like to spend less money now and we'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. 
And as long as we do that, as long as we put antibiotics in our foods, as long as we put pesticides in our plants and, and preservatives in our foods, we're going to be experiencing this. You know, the food we eat today is very different than what we ate a thousand years ago and a hundred years ago. You know, everything cavemen ate were, was organic, free range and organic. And even our grandparents, they went out and they picked their food. They had what they had on their farm or what their neighbors grew. They ate the way we talk now is special, farm to table, by within a hundred miles and sustainable. And that's an up and coming thing and it's a very good thing. And it really would make a very big difference. But above that, we have to take the chemicals out of the air and out of the water. We have to take the chemicals off of the food. A very few handful of corporations have taken over all of the production. So they've not only taken over the production of the food, they've taken over the science, they've taken over the technology and the knowledge, they've taken over the rights to own all these things, such as seeds, which are the basis of life. And all of these changes have happened actually mostly in the last 50 years. People talk about returning to local and regionalized food systems. I think, to me, I interpret it to going back to a time like that. But what those food systems had, you could never eat anything out of season. You would, like the raspberries I just had for lunch, you would never be eating those in December. You wouldn't really have coffee, and you wouldn't have chocolate, and you wouldn't have bananas. Three generations ago, the refrigerator did not exist. So you have to eat stuff that's, particularly the perishable stuff, that is produced locally and consumed within a certain period of time. Now we can eat stuff that has been harvested, you know, two years before. What that implies, what is it going to do to us? I think it's going to be getting worse for several reasons. The more we genetically modify food, the more foreign it is to us. And genetically modified food is really a pretty big thing now, uh, not just in our country, but in the world. And the second thing is as we use pesticides and food additives and preservatives and things, those things get much further away from real food and further away from our immune system recognizing them. And of course there's the issue of infections and food handlers and, and toxins and things that are in our, our food. You know, you use dirty water to water your vegetables. You eat the vegetable, you get those toxins. And so I do think it's going to be an increasingly bad epidemic. We also have the issue of antibiotics, which are fed to cows and also to meat animals, particularly poultry. And I myself would be very concerned about buying poultry from a farm that I do not know. And humans cannot afford to allow themselves to become resistant to antibiotics because we are going to need these antibiotics very dearly someday when we have future outbreaks of diseases and we are wasting them now. Not only are we wasting the resources of these antibiotics, but we are making ourselves immune to them. So these treatments will do us no good at all when we need them the most. The one thing is like, how do you find out you have them without like actually finding out the hard way? But how do you first identify that you have an allergy? How do you even know you have one? We have symptoms of like runny nose, feeling bad. We think, oh, we got the flu, but could it be a food allergy? I don't know. There are many, many different reactions that you can have to a food. Those can vary anything from headaches to joint pains to digestive problems of all types to chronic anemia uh, to osteoporosis. You name it, if there's a health problem, it probably can be tied in to a food reaction. If you have a car problem and you go to the mechanic, they don't say, gee, I'm really sorry you've got an irritable car, it's just not running well, right? You just got bad car syndrome. There are many, many people that suffer from IBS and don't realize it. 
We know that at least 15% of the population has IBS, but probably most of them don't call it IBS. For every one person that's got GI symptoms, there are eight that don't. They have symptoms somewhere else in their body their thyroid, their brain, their knees. I was sleeping 16, 18 hours a day, still never feeling fully rested. I was anxious all the time. I was getting married and I was still depressed and, and crying a lot. And I wasn't really living a quality life. Uh, the most common uh, problem which I see in my practice is fatigue. So most of the patients in my practice who have, for example, gluten intolerance or any type of other food intolerance, if it's not true allergy but intolerance, uh, they experience fatigue and it lasts up to several hours after consuming of inappropriate food, right? So uh, the other symptoms which we see, joint pain, muscle pain, headaches, so which can last for so, from a couple of hours up to days. I was diagnosed six years ago. Uh, it was about 10 years where I had symptoms, gastrointestinal symptoms. I had always struggled with the neurological issues um, like anxiety, depression, uh, different things like that, just brain fog. And I always struggled with those during high school, but we kind of just figured that was the way that I am. And the gastrointestinal symptoms, I just figured that I had a lot of fiber in my diet. I didn't really understand. We didn't put two and two together until my thyroid started failing. And it wasn't until I developed Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is very common in those with untreated celiac disease. Um, they typically develop a secondary autoimmune disease if it goes untreated for a long time, that I was diagnosed with celiac disease. Celiac disease is defined by one thing, and that is damage in the small intestine called villus atrophy. So, uh, how do we define gluten intolerance? Well, uh, I like to use that expression that it's a disease which goes against the grain. Right? <laughs> so, uh, first of all, it's a permanent disease. It's a genetically based intolerance and it results in chronic inflammation and systemic autoimmune responses. So, what does it mean? It means that once you're gluten intolerant and once you develop reaction, you cannot start gluten again and expect that you won't react to that. So it's a permanent condition. I compare it when I talk to my patients compared to alcohol. If you drink constantly, you're constantly drunk. So you drink more or less, it doesn't matter if you're drunk, right? Then you go sober and then you stay sober for a while, then drink a little bit and you feel huge effect of the alcohol. It's the same true for gluten and other things. Patients who have celiac disease and non-celiac gluten intolerance, they're prone to tumors. So they're prone to lymphomas, they're prone to colon cancer. It's a known fact. And so tumor surveillance is a part of the treatment of gluten intolerance. The last myth is that everyone with celiac disease has symptoms. Then uh, we ask our patients to go gluten-free for at least three months and then challenge themselves. Go and try some gluten after that. And if symptoms are reproducible by the gluten challenge, by definition, this is gluten intolerance. Basically, where do you even go to find out this information? I saw over a dozen different physicians from different specialties. I saw a rheumatoid physician because I used to have bilateral swelling in my fingers and um, knees and hips, and I had an elevated sedimentation rate. I saw a neurologist for my depression. They thought I had MS because I had some weird issues going on with my muscles. And so I saw a bunch of general practitioners. I saw an endocrinologist, and finally, 
I saw an OB Gen tested me for everything under the sun, realized that my um, cortisol levels were off and that my thyroids had been trending down and no one had ever done a full thyroid panel. So um, he did, and it was very interesting to see what he found. And my cortisol levels have been trending down, and he said, I really don't know what to do for you. He said, I can you know, treat this, but you have other issues, and I can't figure it out, so go see this guy. Skin testing is not helpful for detecting most food reactions because it only detects your classic allergic reactions, which are hives, anaphylaxis, eczema, uh, maybe asthma, and allergic rhinitis. So your allergists, that's what they're thinking about, and they're thinking about environmental allergens. They're thinking about pollens and trees, you know, and all that kind of stuff. That's what they think of when, like your allergist won't even be able to diagnose your gluten reaction or your celiac disease, even if the symptoms are the same, because they just won't go there. They won't test for it, they won't look for it, because to them it's not an allergy. So this is why it's so challenging, why you have to be your own advocate and take things into your own hands and figure out who you've got to see to help you. Or your pet has a problem and you go to the vet and say they have itchy skin, they have something itchy and they're doing something. What does the vet say? And they look at the diet. So your, your pets are getting better care. Early detection is extremely important because by early detection of having measuring predictive antibodies, you can remove the triggers and therefore you can prevent occurrence of a disease. And in relation again to food IgG testing, let me give you several examples. If an individual is making antibody against wheat or milk, and those antibodies, they are already in the blood. If blood-brain barriers get open for some reason, if we have patient is having leaky gut, patient is releasing endotoxins, the endotoxins can open the blood-brain barriers. Now these antibodies can attack the neurons, and the results of that will be devastating neurologic disorders such as MS and other neurologic disorders. Real quick course for you on what's leaky gut. Your intestines are a tube, 20 to 25 feet long. It winds around in the center of your abdomen. The inside of the tube is lined with shag carpeting. This shag is where calcium is absorbed. This shag, vitamin C. This shag, good proteins. Other shags, good fats. All the shags absorb different nutrients. When you have celiac disease, your shags are worn down. You got Berber. <laughs> With a food allergy, it doesn't depend on the amount of the food. It doesn't depend on what type of food it is. It's every single time you get exposed to that protein and that your threshold is set off, you're going to get that chemical reaction. You're going to get an allergic reaction from it. I think, you know, people will try this diet and do it three quarters of the way or 90% of the way. It's so important to do it 100% because your body will still react as if you took from one crumb, the same reaction as a whole loaf of bread. So you're, that army of antibodies will come in and flood your system and cause inflammation and a lot of damage to the tissue as the immune system is hunting down that gluten molecule and trying to kill it. It kills a lot of other things or injures a lot of other things along the way. So I think that's really interesting. People always say, well, I'm almost all gluten-free. Well, no, you have to be 100%. And that one crumb, one single crumb equals 20 parts per million. So it's really important not to use, not cross-contaminating your environment. So using a separate toaster if you're dealing with a kitchen where people are eating wheat and not. Every forkful of what you put in your mouth is either inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. Every forkful. There's no neutrals except healthy water. That's the only neutral. We'll be surprised to some of the people to learn that, for example, if you develop Alzheimer 
or you know, uh, multiple sclerosis, ultimately may be related to the way that you eat. I'm trying to figure out how they come about. I mean, there's been like a recent spike, especially with children for you know, peanut allergies and things like that, so. The first answer is because people pay more attention to what they eat. So we're a little bit more cautious about what we eat. And we pay more attention between symptoms which we had and the food which we eat, right? It's all the news, and so I think that to some degree it's a matter of uh, people being a bit more educated. The GMO foods, the antibiotics we're exposed to, the chemicals, the pesticides, the vaccinations, the bad air, the toxic chemicals in the carpets that we have in our home, it goes on, the heavy metals in the water, in the fish. The more a subject becomes studied, the more people become aware of it. And the more people are aware of it, the more they look to see where they have it. So people who never heard of a certain disease, once they hear it, it's in the family, they'll be looking for it and they'll be sure probably in most cases to find it. I think that genetics are a huge issue when it comes to food reactions and food intolerances. I see in my patients, in, in family members, a lot of overlap and similarity in the kinds of foods that they react to. So I think it's something that that genetic predisposition is carried on, is passed on, just like it is in celiac disease, it is for other food reactions as well, and you tend to see a higher incidence in kids and other family members. The other thing is that we have had a tremendous increase in prepared foods. The number of prepared foods is huge, and every one of those foods uses a huge amount of some flour. They may use potato flour, they may use wheat flour, corn flour, but you can be sure that almost every food is going to have a lot of different things in it. And those foods may become popular. And the more you eat them, the more people you can discover have reactions to them. Why we have so many immune reactivities against food? Because of change in the structure of the proteins. The modified foods, which is you know, completely different from the original food proteins. There are several theories for that. Um, one of my favorites is the hygiene theory, meaning that we as a society are cleaner in our daily habits, and so our gut isn't exposed to the same microbes that it used to be. You have um, lots of studies to support that children who grow up in the country have better immune systems than children that grow up in the city. So I think that plays a part. I also think that our processed foods play a part. Um, um, people in our society, we tend to, to, peanuts for example, we tend to roast peanuts um, and we have high peanut allergies. But in other countries where roasting is not a normal process of serving peanuts, they boil them, they don't have as many peanut allergies. So part of processing um, can play a part in that. We've been changing the composition of our food supply and I think we're not looking at that carefully enough and I think that there is a a population of kids and some adults who are now feeling the effects of that. I think that it's probably a mixture of nature and nurture, meaning that there's probably something in the genetics behind it, but there's definitely an environmental component as well, and it's how those two interplay that determines whether you have a food allergy or not. I'd like to know if being gluten-free is a as prevalent as people say it is. Gradually, it dawned on people that there were some foods, like wheat, that were particularly bad. And when they began to study it, they found there was a protein called gluten that was in wheat that you were particularly liable to become intolerant to, or to be intolerant. So there is definitely validity to avoiding gluten. Putting aside that we probably don't have adequate testing and that we miss a lot, probably 3% of our population is really celiac positive, genetically and biopsy. Probably 10% are gluten sensitive by diagnosis of lab testing. But I think the population is even bigger that truly are gluten sensitive. The reason why we cannot digest probably gluten is because we didn't evolve with that. You know, for 2.5 million years, we've been as a species gluten-free for most of the time. The other thing is that, again, gluten is perceived when undigested as an enemy by our immune system, like we perceive bacteria. 
It, you, you deploy the same weaponry that you typically deploy when under attack from a microorganisms like a bacterium. So let's talk about uh, gluten intolerance. Uh, so this is the most common food-driven autoimmune disease affecting humans. So if we look at uh, the penetration of the genes, so approximately somewhere between 10 to 35 percent of general population are genetically predisposed to gluten intolerance. Uh, the highest prevalence uh, are among people of Irish origin, Ashkenazi Jews, and Italians. So the prevalence among Irish is close to 25 percent. If anyone were to say celiac disease does not exist, I would be a little surprised, but then I would say, well, if you go to PubMed, which stands for Public Medical Information, PubMed.gov, it's the National Library of Medicine, and type into the search engine celiac disease, you will have over 19,000 articles that pop up immediately. There are at least 19,000 research teams that have spent months of their lives reviewing some topic related to a subject that that person is saying doesn't exist. I would say that's not likely accurate. Brushing this off as a fat diet is a sin, uh, considering that the gluten-free diet, for example, is the cornerstone for the treatment for celiac disease. It's like the insulin for diabetics. So you can't brush this off as a fat. I mean, same for people that suffer other gluten-related disorders like gluten sensitivity or with allergy. If they don't embrace a gluten-free diet, they will be seriously sick. So if you don't embrace the gluten-free diet, again, you will be in jeopardy for great consequences. If you don't embrace the South Beach diet, that's not the case. So you can't really make that kind of comparison. Now, what is the element of truth that you feel better going gluten-free or you lose weight going gluten-free? There is no element of truth. Of course, if you decide to go natural gluten-free, so to use only products that are natural gluten-free, now you're forced to eat healthy to buy stuff that you need to cook yourself because otherwise you don't know what is in there. Unfortunately, going gluten-free doesn't always mean eating healthy and well. A standard gluten-free diet in the U.S. includes gluten-free donuts, gluten-free breads, gluten-free baked products, white rice, more white rice, more white rice, white rice-based products, not the things at the that are really the core of a gluten-free diet. When you look at the core of a gluten-free diet, it's a simple, wonderfully balanced diet. It's fruits and vegetables, it's dairy products, it's meats, it's grains. So 60% of the population that is eating gluten-free has not been tested by a doctor, which I find very interesting. At first people were, oh, I just have to get tested to prove it, you know, and now they're just taking themselves off it and they're proving it themselves by elimination diet. And when I taught over 5,000 people in my cooking school, that was the thing I suggested. The testing may not be 100%, but what is, is your body's reaction when you take it out and then add back in what it is you're thinking you're intolerant of. So I think it's pretty cool that people are finding it as a healthier diet. And I say, well, just trust yourself. You know you're sick when you eat it, don't eat it. Because what happens if you eat it and the lab work comes back negative and it's fine? Are you going to go eat it again? And the answer is a lot of people will. Even though they feel sick, they'll eat it because they'll say, well, my lab tests were fine, so I'm going to eat it. Don't do that. Do not let yourself do that. If you feel better, trust it and say, okay, I know, I can't eat this, I can't find it on the lab or whatever, I just, I feel better not eating this food. It takes months to bring those antibodies down. It does, it takes several months. And so if you've only been avoiding it for a week or a month, or that's no big deal. But if you've been avoiding it for six months or beyond, then it may have dramatically changed your, your lab results. If you eat something and it makes you feel horrible, well then, and you don't eat it and you feel better. I mean, that just seems like a very obvious step to me. And I think people underestimate how important our food is in our bodies. You know, we have come such a long way from eating a diet that consists of whole foods. And the more processed your food, I think the harder it is for your body. It's possible if we only ate whole foods, we'd have no problems with gluten and these other things, but everything is, all the packaged food, I just think it doesn't, it's not really what our bodies are meant to eat. When we first started this magazine, you had to spell the word 
celiac, you had to spell gluten, you had to explain it to people. I mean, you couldn't find any food out there. The manufacturers of gluten-free food, you know, you could count them on one hand. And now that everybody knows what gluten is, even in, uh, you know, rural areas, they've heard of it. So it's kind of exciting. In a way, it's a wonderful thing because the market is booming. The products are just out there. You can go to your local grocery store, you go to a restaurant and people are aware of it. And in public schools, people are aware of it. And so I love that heightened awareness. When we first started the magazine, it was it, we were rolling the boulder up the hill to try to get people to be aware of what celiac disease was. Now the downside to that is that it's so popular that I think there's a lot of confusion about how strict do you have to be on this diet. And the spectrum of gluten sensitivity is really wide and we haven't really figured that out yet. And so we haven't even defined it yet in a way of biomarkers. So you can eat gluten and maybe feel foggy brained or you can eat gluten and develop you know, major uh, intestinal damage and you're still all considered gluten-free or you can just go on the gluten-free diet because you think that might help you lose weight. And every one of those people is considered gluten-free and so the marketplace is serving every single one of those people. I think that the people who are doing it now uh, because it's kind of a fad, I think that will calm down a little bit. We're kind of in a frenzy right now. So I think generally it's a great thing, but it is adding to the confusion. And, and maybe it might even be adding to some of the safety issues for um, celiacs. On the other hand, it's alerted the FDA you know, to this kind of issue, and I think it's prompted even more studies into what's going on with a reactivity to gluten. So I think overall it's a good thing. Because so many disorders are associated with gluten, if there is a history of immune disorders and autoimmunities in the family, I highly recommend those individuals to be on gluten-free and dairy-free diet, even currently, do not have symptomatology. And while gluten indeed nutritionally is useless, the consequence of going gluten-free, if you don't do this right, depriving yourself of minerals, vitamins, fibers, can be, you know, detrimental. So you're trying to fix something, actually you end up to make stuff worse. So I personally would never recommend to go gluten-free unless one, there is a rational, and two, that you do under the supervision of dietitian. And I honestly think if you don't need to be gluten-free, there's really no reason to do it. I don't see any reason to be gluten-free if you have no problem with it. But if you have GI problem or you have any immune disorders, neurologic disorders, arthritis, then I highly recommend. Should we go all gluten-free? I would say if you go to that extreme, then we should all stop using cars because they pollute. Are we really ready to go to the Amish lifestyle? The glycemic index of wheat, that it's higher than most fruit, and that two slices of bread, your body thinks it's eating a Snickers bar. That's how much insulin it produces. So that's why many people lose weight when they go on a gluten-free diet, is because they begin stabilizing their insulin levels and their blood sugar levels. What modern breeding has done for wheat is generally jack up the gluten content, I believe, uh, so that it bakes better and makes better white bread and stuff like that. So older genetics, some of the more traditional varieties, they may have a much lower gluten content. Is it true that most people have intolerances to milk? The number one most common food sensitivity is milk and dairy products. Heads and tails above everything else. And I think the next most common as a group are eggs, soy, corn, and gluten. But milk far and away is the biggest. Other than cats, we're the only species of animals that drinks milk of other animals. And we're the only species other than cat where adults drink milk at all. So it really is very foreign to us. And it's not lactose intolerance, although that really is a real issue and significant. It's that we don't break down the casein, the, the protein in the milk, and have immune responses to it. In my experience, most people that react to dairy do not have a lactose intolerance. And there's a real clear distinction in those areas. A lactose intolerance is an enzyme deficiency. A lactose intolerance can only cause some gas, bloating, some digestive distress. You have to have a dairy allergy to cause anything else because you have to have an inflammatory reaction. 
And a lactose intolerance is not an inflammatory reaction, it's an enzyme deficiency. So if you're taking a lactate pill to digest your lactose, or you're drinking lactose-free milk, that won't help you if you have one of these broader inflammatory issues to dairy that cause things like congestion and headaches and all kinds of other problems, just for example, like gluten can. The fairly standard view is that uh, people that are lactose intolerant can drink raw milk because there's lactase enzymes in the raw milk, whereas uh, in pasteurized milk, those enzymes are, are damaged and destroyed. And so obviously the enzyme that's meant to break down that milk protein, if it's not there, you're gonna have problems digesting them if, if you can't make them yourself. And I think that's the issue. When you remove the fat from the milk, you're also removing the protein. When you homogenize milk, you're breaking down this protein shell so the fat mixes in with the milk and you can't separate it. Therefore, the skim milk has to be processed before these little particles are broken down. Skim milk naturally has a bluish tint to it, which the consumers are not too crazy about. They're not used to seeing milk that is blue, and I can understand that. And as a way around this, the dairies had a casein product that was taken out from milk when making other products. But when they put this casein back in, from what I understand, the pasteurization is done afterwards, and this casein product can become, does become carcinogenic. What is the difference between organic and conventional farming? There's a lot of different ways to farm. As farmers, we all have to deal with the same issues. If it's weeds, if it's insect pests, if it's other kinds of pests, uh, diseases, things like this. So when we talk about organic, when we talk about conventional, part of what we're talking about is how are we managing our crops? How are we managing our vegetables? As an organic farmer, whether or not we're certified or not, we're looking for cultural practices and biological responses rather than chemical responses. With like extremely good tasting products, you know, high bricks levels, high sugar levels, lots of minerals, you're growing nutrient dense food is what you're doing. And that's what organic is to me. It's not what it is to a lot of people, but um, to me that's what it is. We think that by raising a crop that's healthier in the first place and that where we focus on making sure that it has the proper nutrition, that we have a higher quality product and make people feel better. They don't have to eat as much to feel full and to feel physically satisfied. There's sort of me as a consumer, I don't know what I don't know, right? Like when you buy at a grocery store, there's no face on it, there's no relationship. It's less of what I'm afraid of or worried about from other food. I mean, you sort of assume that there's gonna be some pesticide residue or something like that on on food that you find at the grocery store. Are genetically modified foods the reason for the great increase in food sensitivities? A good example that I can think of is something simple like blueberries. Blueberries, you grow them on the farm and the farmers have made them a certain color and a certain size and they make them slow to deteriorate and they create a shell that's a little thicker so in the, in the movement it doesn't bruise. And they make them resistant to bugs and, and birds and this is and that's and they feed them a certain way. And we get those blueberries in the store and they look great and they you know, don't really taste that great but they look great but they're really different. When you get wild blueberries from the coast of Maine, they're completely stressed out. They're frozen at night, they have salt water on them, the birds are picking at them, the insects are eating them. Those are stressed out plants. When we eat them, first of all, they're delicious, but they contain all of these chemicals that help us. So those chemicals that the plant needs to survive help us. And so those micronutrients are wonderful. And a lot of the food we eat looks great, but it lacks those things. Well, let's talk about GMOs first. Uh, they, they are not allowed in, in Europe, so they don't deal with the problem. Here, on the other hand, it is a little bit more relaxed, you know, low about this. Nevertheless, despite this discrepancy, the amount, the entity of the problem is pretty much the same. So for me, this means that, you know, the genetically modified food stuff could not be explaining these epidemics or problems which we're, we're witnesses here. There must be much more than that. I don't dispute that there can be a component, but not, not the driving force uh, of, of this huge problem. In the U.S. is the worst. 
because in Europe already have many laws which taken out many, many chemicals, including some of the food colorings I was talking about, uh, bisphenol A, uh, uh, some of the cosmetics they're not using. And so they are doing a better job than removing some of these chemicals, some of the pesticides, which they are not using, still are used in the U.S. And so therefore, yes, we are using more chemicals and we have more allergies, sensitivities, and autoimmunities. GMO stands for genetically modified organisms. There are a lot of claims that are made about negative impacts to human health and livestock health from eating GMO crops. And the studies and the claims are such that we just want to avoid GMO crops and we want to raise our crops non-GMO and we also aren't using the pesticides. So if you are marketing yourself as organic, you can't use GMO crops or seed. What we've done is we select for whatever traits we want, but it's always been done within the ancestral genetics of that species. There are different strategies for breeding within plants, and certainly we have started to hybridize plants where we'll take a corn, this kind of corn and this kind of corn, and we'll put them together in the lab where they might not naturally have crossed. Uh, and that's sort of the modern hybridization process. Genetic engineering is a new thing where we're able to splice genes from one species of all of the species, right, uh, on the planet. Um, and splice that into another species. So completely different kingdoms even. Breeding a tomato that can take all of that transport and then still last on the shelf for at least five days or something, you're breeding for characteristics that generally aren't going to taste good. Can we blame everything on gluten, soy, corn, and so forth? We cannot blame everything. Maybe these are playing some role. You can have insect resistance. You can have drought tolerance. You can have herbicide resistance. These are the things that most GMOs are made for. You can do it with traditional breeding. Almost nobody knows this, okay? And that is almost everything that genetic modification is used for can be done with natural breeding. So why is it that we have this genetically modified organisms in our food and in our farming and all over the place? Patents. Patents are the lifeblood of biotechnology. And the reason is if you genetically modify it, you can own it and you can sell it. For the GMO issue, I think lots of consumers are really shocked to understand what it is, like what the actual technology is and who benefits from it, because it's not consumers. And it's actually not really farmers. It's these seed companies, and they're seed companies who are actually chemical companies first, right? And so I think that the link, the real, it's very hard to break the link between GMOs, as they're being mostly used at this point, and these chemical companies that you're changing these crops so they can be exposed to pretty tough chemicals and that they'll survive and the weeds are supposed to die and now it's not working. We've so overused these chemicals that the weeds are now resistant to the first generation and we're moving on to a next generation and we're talking about tougher chemicals. So we're, the next generation of GMO crops is gonna be packaged up to work with 2,4-D. 2,4-D was an ingredient in Agent Orange. It is a tough chemical. It's tough on the environment, on farm workers, on public health. We shouldn't be using more of it and that's what's gonna happen if we go this route. There have been efforts to what they call put a moral gloss. Because you see the GMO industry spends hundreds of millions of dollars advertising that their products are gonna feed the world, they're going to cure the sick, and they're going to end poverty, and they're gonna do all these other good things. Let's disregard those nice, beautiful ads with starving children with their bowls of golden rice, and let's look at actually what GMOs are actually being used for. They're developed by the chemical industry, Monsanto, DuPont, these companies, Dow, big, huge chemical companies to use more chemicals. So you get Roundup Ready soybeans, Roundup Ready corn, doused with way more chemicals than were being used in even industrial agriculture, always uses chemicals. But GMO agriculture uses 
five times as many or ten times. I mean, the increase in these use of herbicides is, is just astronomical. They're also used to make insecticides, put the insecticides in the plants. So you have to ask yourself, what possible good would it be for us as human beings or for the microbes in the soil or the fish in the water and the frogs? What possible good would it do for us to be doused with all these very toxic chemicals? So that's how GMOs are being used. I leave it to you to decide whether or not any good can come from it. The largest vegetable seed company in the world was bought in the last several years by Monsanto in this case. They're not the only company and that's what companies do, but it certainly raises alarms. I mean, you certainly see fewer and fewer people, not just the company, but decision makers having control over what seeds and what genetics are available. It might surprise people to know just what percentage of the food grown in the United States is actually genetically engineered. You look at the percentage of corn, cotton, soy, canola sugar beets. Those are things that increasingly are becoming genetically engineered and it's either going into processed foods or it's going to animal feed. And I guess maybe one thing I would add that people, a lot of people don't know and be surprised about is when you see on a, an ingredient label that it says something's made out of sugar, it's a lot of times coming from a genetically engineered beet. So unless you see it says cane sugar, you don't really have that information. So that might be something that surprises folks. There were discussions about whether there should be any labeling of GM crops because they really have snuck into our food supply in a way that I think most people are unaware of. That pretty much any piece of corn you eat that is not certified organic is GM corn. And so people just argued there's no reason to tell consumers. So it's like this kind of paternalistic attitude like, we believe they're safe. Why should we tell you that you're eating GM food? If you look at the amount of corn produced in the United States, it's something that is making its way into our food in a number of different ways, from corn syrup to all kinds of other ingredients that are highly processed that people just wouldn't expect are being made out of corn. It's become our new sugar and because it's cheap and we can produce a heck of a lot of it and Americans <laughs> have an undying desire for sugar. Corn is kind of a, for me, a done product because of the cross-pollination in the GMOs in our land. So there is, and I hope I don't have any corn farmers that I'm defending out there, but it's causing so much reaction in our bodies, it's almost as much as gluten, right? I mean, I break out in blisters if I have corn chips, you know, and they're all gluten-free and all that. It's, it's the GMO. They were introduced in the 1990s without our knowledge. Uh, Allergies rose 200% across the board, and these kids are being born with a whole slew of problems. So, so I stay away from corn. If you buy it from another country, Europe will not allow GMOs in their system. For example, we, we tried to send over corn to Africa, and here they are starving. They rejected it. They left it at the port because they knew it was going to be really a thirsty crop and something that was going to change their whole ecosystem, so they did not accept our donation. So that's just something to know. 98% of the corn seed that you can buy in this country has got genetic traits you know, inserted into it. Tell me that you know, there's no choice for people who don't want to grow GMO stuff. Corn, soy, and sugar are the three big ones. Um, so, and those, those ingredients are in, in almost everything we eat, every processed food we eat. Um, so the, the jury's out about that. We're kind of having this uh, experimentation on our food supply. Uh, we don't know what the effects of that are. And in the world of celiac disease, what the study suggests is up to 50% of celiacs also have a cross sensitivity to corn. This BT corn exudes in its leaves and in its roots and in its corn an insecticide. We have no way of evaluating the impact of that insecticide on the human gut. And the industry says, for instance, oh, it's the same as the BT that organic farmers using. The lies are endless. We could spend all day on this, just the lies. Do you know that even 10 or 15 years ago, corn wasn't considered a food that you could have an allergy 
too. When I first started this magazine, the person who was in charge of a fan, Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Network, I basically interviewed her and she said, you know, there's really no evidence that there is a corn allergy. It's not that she was wrong, it's that the food supply has changed so much. And now corn is, although it's not in the big eight, you know, people are really reactive to it. And why is that? And if this is the primary source of feed for our beef cows, and what does that say about our supply of beef? It's almost like the beef industry is becoming nothing more than a vehicle to get the corn from the cornfield to the consumer. It's important for consumers to realize that when they're eating animal products, they're also eating everything that that animal ate. And that means if it's not organic, it most certainly is a GMO crop. And so it's important if you're going to eat animal products and you're trying to avoid GMO, then you need to avoid non-organic animal products. When you look at this genetically modified thing again, you're asking your body to recognize, to process a protein that is foreign to it. So gluten in the scheme of genetics is about 100 years old, you know, and we're five, 10,000 years old. So in that 100 years, we have not yet found, as a, as a, in general, we have not yet found a way to process this. So many, many people have immune responses to it. What's happening now is that our immune system is activated so much earlier in life for so many more thousands of antigens or things that offend the body and the immune system reacts to. There are thousands of antigens we're exposed to now every day we weren't exposed to 60 years ago, 70 years ago. So our immune system is working overtime to try and protect us doing everything it can. So it's hypervigilant, it's on edge all the time. Is there any good to be had from genetic modification? Uh, I've really looked carefully at this, I get this question all the time, and my answer is flat out no. The studies have come out now that show that GMO will cause intestinal permeability, which is the gateway into the development of autoimmune disease. So any GMO foods have the potential of doing that. It's very complicated, and there's a lot of different issues involved. Um, and I think we're just now beginning to wake up to the implications of what's going on. The one thing I can see changing is that as this GMO experiment that they've sort of rammed down our throat for the last 20 years, as it manifests itself in our population and people keep getting immune system problems and um, food allergies, gradually we'll wake up to the fact that this was not such a good thing. Well, I'd really like to know that there were investigations into GMO to start with. That bugs me that back in England, where I'm from, that they're banned. And yet here we are, we have so much difficulty knowing, even if we're, you know, eating them or, or, or imbibing ourselves. Is the federal government regulating uh, GMOs? And the answer is no, not really. The worst part of not having any federal protections in our, in our laws is, is that we think they're there. You know, we have this idea that government regulation is going to protect us from greed or corruption or pollution, but it doesn't happen anymore and it's called industry capture. And what happens is, is, what's happened since Ronald Reagan was elected is the industries that are being regulated by government have captured the regulatory system. So the FDA is being run by former Monsanto executives. So we have a lot of concerns um, about GMOs. They range from big picture. You know, what are they doing to the food supply? What are they doing to the economics and the ownership and the control of the food supply? And then we're really concerned that we don't know enough about whether they're safe to eat. And the regulations and the system we have for approving them is really weak. For all of this talk from the biotech industry about how regulated they are, they're really not very regulated at all. They do the science. 
and give that data to the government, which doesn't do their own science. You know, we have very little independent research, and we don't even get to track what's happening to people who eat these foods because we don't tell people they're eating these foods because we don't label them. So it's, you know, it's really, and then, and then there's environmental concerns. I mean, this is a technology that's very closely tied to chemical use in the fields. There's environmental impacts from that. There's public health impacts from that. So it's just at every layer, kind of from macro all the way to personal consumption, we have concerns. The three agencies are the EPA. They regulate the pesticides. And the FDA, supposedly, they concern about the allergies. And that's very, I, I would say, actually, in that one small area of allergies, they actually still pay attention to whether or not a food is an allergen. But again, you have to understand, it's all self-reporting. The USDA is really an arm of the chemical industry at this point. They're not even studying the uses of chemicals or the amounts that are being used or how they're recombined. It's a, it's a total failure on the part of the federal government to stand between the public health, the common good, and the greed of these corporations. I think that there is definitely some improvement that can be made between talking between the FDA and the CDC to determine what exactly is going into our foods? Is it affecting the health of our nation? And is that something that we need to address sooner rather than later? Because we don't know exactly the long-term effects of it. A good way to look at the regulatory system is not as a chain, but as a patchwork quilt with a lot of holes in it. And this is the trick to science, is like, we have to ask the right questions. So it's not science, it's technology. And with technology, we have to know what our motivations are. I wish you would label things properly and people would stop talking about being more expensive because it's really stupid. They don't understand the labeling process. have come up with a host of reasons from it'll cost too much, which, um, you know, they change labels all the time to say new and light and low calorie. I mean, the, that is a specious argument. There's a strong lobby against even labeling of these ingredients, and uh, it's been rather alarming to watch that because to me it seems pretty ethical to label our products like what's in it and what's not in it. So when you look at the allergen labeling, it was done years ago. 2004, they added wheat, which was a new thing, and now they've moved forward with actually the gluten-free labeling. So the more people that make their concerns known, it's always helpful. And um, that's not to say just because there's nine on the label now, there won't be 10 or 12 later. The day-to-day -day issue for people is that they need to know what they're being exposed to, and these are folks that need accurate information. The labeling issue is extremely important when you have a specific sensitivity or intolerance to a foodstuff that is used, let's say, in food industry. Gluten is the classical example. If uh, it's used as a filler or additive and you don't label, I don't know, chicken or whatever that naturally should be gluten-free, you don't know that you're exposed. But if you find out you're allergic to a food, that's vital information knowing what's in that food, 
what it came in contact with, how it was produced. It's just a super urgent one for folks that are dealing with allergies. Do we label everything? And maybe that is the most appropriate thing to do. I mean, if people find that they are sensitive to corn-fed beef or corn-fed chicken, then they have a right to know what they're eating. Labeling is only gonna go so far because there's not, there's not gonna be enough room on the label to really tell the story. People need to know, people need to care. And once they care, they're gonna look at things more closely. But I'm not really sure how we get there. If nobody buys local food, then there aren't gonna be any local farmers, for instance. If you don't really care about the packaging and the waste, if you don't care about the, the cleanliness of your water and make that something that you care about in the way you vote or the way you read the news. People need to find out where their food's coming from, how it's grown, and that's what's really driving a lot of this consumer demand for more information. I mean, we've been fighting really common, basic information, not extraordinary. It's been a vicious fight for 15 years to get the country of origin labeling on meat and produce. And right now the meat industry is in a full attack on the concept that they have to say where meat comes from. Because they want to say everything comes from the U.S. if they kill the animal here and they don't want to disclose that the animal was born in another country like Canada. They want to say it only matters where it dies, not where it lived. They're challenging it at the WTO, they're challenging it in court. I mean constant fights to get something that seems so elementary that you get on a t-shirt or you get on uh, you know, a CD or a camera, you know where that was made, but they don't want us to even know where our food was made, like what country it was made in. They still want us to think we're buying local. They still want us to think we're buying from a company we bought from 20 years ago, and it probably isn't. So natural flavoring is one of those things that I don't think means a whole lot. Just like when you see a bag of potato chips that tells you it's natural, that means very, very little. And this is all because the federal government has a loose regulatory scheme saying what you can actually put on a package. And we're starting to see a lot more pushback around that, uh, especially on things like natural, where folks have been making that claim, in my opinion, falsely for a number of years, saying that foods that are by definition not natural could be labeled as such in a grocery store. I think that companies don't want consumers to think too much about what happens before the store. You know, how did that food get here? I think they're very happy to market to us, like walk through a typical grocery store and count how many products have farm in the name or a picture of a silo and a red pickup truck. It's always red. I don't know why it's always red. You know, in a grassy field. And these are not foods that came from a farm that looked like that, right? They're probably heavily processed. Uh, they're probably from a pretty large, you know, conglomerate that is doesn't look like the picture on the package. They know what we want. They're not providing it, but they don't want people to make that connection. One thing I definitely would like to see on the labels is the fact of whether or not a food is genetically engineered. This is something that has been kept in the dark from consumers for a long time, and it's something that we need more information about. I think there's a number of other issues that we could try and make sure that information is on the label, but this is something consumers have been calling for for almost 20 years, and it's now just taking hold in the United States. I think consumers are shocked when they kind of get, get a little exposure to the fight over labeling in particular, and they realize the extent to which these companies do not want this information out there. Tens of millions of dollars that are being spent to prevent this minor change, this minor requirement that you just say, we use this technology, that's it. They're spending tens of millions of dollars lobbying all over the place to try to prevent people from getting this information. And I think that should make people suspicious. I think it does, and it should. I mean, what are they so afraid of? Why are they so afraid to say that their technology is out there? I think people in general are not clued in about the amount of money behind the effort to, to block labeling of GMOs. So for example, Grocers Manufacturing Association. Um, there was a case in California that uh, the Attorney General is investigating where Pepsi and Monsanto and Dow and DuPont and many other companies funneled contributions um, through the Grocery Manufacturers Association so they didn't have to be public about them to oppose the referendum. And if people knew how much was being put into the fight against labeling and convincing, actually manipulating people to think that it's unnecessary and maybe a bad thing to label, I think they'd look a little further into whether it's just label or not label.
I believe every consumer has the right to know if they're eating a GM food. So right now, if you want to avoid GMs, you can buy certified organic products. And I believe in certified organic products for many other reasons other than just the avoidance of GMs. I mean, I think they're better for the environment. But I recognize that not every consumer wants to buy an organic product. So I feel if it has a GM product in it, it should be on the front of that label so consumers can make the choice for themselves. The ironic thing is that when food manufacturers in the States send food abroad to Italy or China or other countries that do not accept GMOs or require GMO labeling, they have to do that. Yet, they maintain that it is a burden to do it for people eating and living in the United States. If there are so many more food allergies than there used to be, where are we going to end up? Where is this heading? For all the good, the joking about things on the late night shows and the cartoons and stuff like that, it's funny, okay? It's funny, I laugh. But there's an undercurrent to that of uh, dismissiveness that's dangerous. I have a great sense of humor, you know, and I think we should all roll with this. But I don't want us ever to think this isn't God awful serious for people who are sick. I mean, this is serious business and it's no joking matter. So when you look at things like the increase in the amount of autoimmune disease, multiple sclerosis and lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis and those types of illnesses, we know that a large part of that is related to gut function and a large part of that is related to how we process or don't process certain foods or the contaminants in foods. And it turns out to be an extremely important thing in terms of the national economy, how much we spend to look at this type of illness, how much we spend to treat people who are not well, and how much it costs us personally not to feel good. So I think there's that whole trend of what's going on here. We're not feeling very well. So how do we go back to the basics, like wholesome single item ingredients the, the way our grandparents or great-grandparents used to eat. I think that's a big trend uh, throughout the nation. We know that from the last 75 years or so, from studies started by the USDA, that the nutritional content of foods, of raw vegetables, is not what it used to be. A carrot that's taken off the shelf, analyzed for major nutrients and major vitamins, now on average shows maybe a quarter to a half of the nutritional content that it used to. I think consumers should read every food label that they can. And I also think that you should be able to pronounce all of the ingredients and you should not eat food with too many ingredients. I mean, I think if you can live that way, your, your health will be so much better. The issue of food allergies and gluten-free food being expensive, and treatment not being available for people who are lower income and don't have terrific resources. It's a crying need. Even people with the best resources whose kids come down with these allergies or sensitivities, they're totally thrown for a loop. I mean, even doctors with all of that background and stuff like, oh my goodness. So how much more difficult is it for families or single moms? What can we do about this? First, we have to, you know, to use as much as possible organic foods. That's number one, if we can afford it. Secondly, to remove all these chemicals, 80,000 of them, 80,000 to 100,000 of them are used, and 5,000 of them are in our food. If we can remove those chemicals from our diet, significantly will help in reduction of percent individual who have food allergy or food immune reactivity. You know, you walk into the grocery store and you see everything there and you just assume it is all food, right? So if you go into the drugstore and you look at all of these over-the-counter medications, they've all been vetted to some degree as they deliver basically on what they promise. So if I go through the grocery store, some things are food and some are like junk food, and maybe junk food shouldn't even have food attached to it. So I, when my kids were little, they would pick up those terrible cereal boxes. And I'm like, okay, if you want those, you can put the cookies back, right? To make a point that they are not, that's not a substitute for a bowl of oatmeal or some eggs or something with some nutritive value. It's basically junk food. So I think that we should just not let that be sold in the grocery store. <laughs> I think that there should be like special stores that have junky food or there should basically I'm arguing for more regulation on 
our food with stronger signals about what is healthy and what is not healthy. Oh, there's lots of good news. <laughs> oh my God, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> it's all good news. I mean, seriously, these problems that we've been talking about are very important, okay? And we're attending to them. There's so many good people out there bringing lawsuits, protesting, writing petitions, do, even doing some of the science that needs to be done, taking the place of the bad guys, okay? The options for people out there are to know your farmer, first and foremost, buy local and go to the farmer's market and establish relationships with producers. The rise of farmer's markets is just one way, from a few hundred to thousands of farmer's markets and that with it, the local farmers that feed those markets. And so what this takes is this takes a lot more effort than people are, are accustomed to, to buy their food. I feel like the best thing that I could say for a consumer that's looking to get this type of food is to start having a conversation with the people that are growing the food. And really that's where it starts. So there are a lot of questions to be asked and there are a lot of different opinions and a lot of people saying one thing or another thing and there are a lot of labels um, but when you have that intimate conversation with the consumer to the grower it sort of goes beyond the labels and the person buying the food can get a feel for is this the type of person that is going to grow the food that I want to be eating and I think ultimately that's that's where a lot of it comes from but at the same time don't just buy into the fact that this is local food therefore it's good food because that's not always true. You know, it, it really depends on farm, farm to farm. You can know best what you're eating if you're just eating plants. You know, start by like eating whole foods, meaning, you know, buy some vegetables, buy some whole grains. If the Europeans can pay between 20 and 30 percent of their annual salary to eat really, really good food, you know, we can go from 8 percent in this country up to 14 or 15. And I think we'd be a whole lot better off for it. Well, you know what is tandoori chicken yeah. in India? What is tandoori chicken? Did you, did you think it's saffron or paprika? No, go online and check. It is food coloring, I think food coloring number five. Wow. Yes. That's awful.